Okay, uh, so this talk is deploying uh, primarily PHP applications with Ansible and also using Ansible Vault and Ansible Dryer. Um, so yeah, this is, we'll be using Drupal 8 as an example um, throughout, this, throughout this talk, so this should be pretty familiar for everybody. Um, but yeah, the tools that we're gonna be looking at are pretty much sort of language agnostic and, and framework agnostic as well. Uh, so we'll start by having a uh, little Ansible crash course in case anybody's not seen or used Ansible before. Uh, then we'll look at how to keep secrets for using Ansible's Vault features. And then we'll look at doing some deployments with a tool called Ansistrano. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a full stack developer. Uh, I do some systems administration work, um, on some personal projects and some freelance projects as well. Uh, so I do a lot of PHP development and Linux systems administration work. Um, in the day I work for Invica. Uh, so I work remotely, I'm based in South Wales. Um, and yeah, I organize the PHP South Wales beta group. So we do monthly meetups you know, very similar to this. So if anybody's around or wants to join in remotely the next couple of months, that we are more than welcome to. And yeah, I'm OP Davis on Drupal.org and Twitter and everywhere pretty much online. And uh, my website is oliverdavis.uk, where I do a lot of blogging about Drupal and PHP and testing and Ansible and various other bits and pieces as well. And this is what my sort of tech stack normally looks like. Um, the, the Drupal one should be probably quite a bit bigger. I've been doing Drupal for about 12 years, I think, at this point, since I started learning it. Um, but I've been, yeah, I work pretty much mostly with Drupal and, and Symfony framework. Uh, so yeah, there's obviously PHP projects as well as you know, Sculpin, which is a static site generator that I was using for my site until quite recently. Uh, we use it for some client projects as well. I did a little, little bit of WordPress work uh, a while ago. Did a talk at WordCamp recently about, about Tello and CSS actually, as well as some JavaScript with Vue and some Angular work as well. Um, but everything you know on this slide, uh, I've been using pretty much everything on this slide. I've been using Ansible for to do some sort of deployment with just to prove the uh, diagnostic point there. Um, okay, so being a, a Drupal meetup, I guess we're pretty much familiar with, with these three companies. Uh, so these are three pretty large, well-known hosting companies that are optimized for, for PHP and for Drupal. Um, and most of these include some sort of built-in deployment system. Uh, so, you know, platform has an option, you just add in commands that you want to run doing a deploy. Acquia has uh, pipelines and I think Pantheon is something similar as well. I've not used Pantheon for quite a while. Um, so yeah, what we're going to talk about isn't really that applicable if you're using any of these sort of systems. Um, although I have used Ansible locally to like push from GitHub and do some compiling and then push into things like Acquia, but we won't talk about that too much here. Uh, if however you're doing using you know one of these services like a, a digital ocean or a linode vps or um or maybe you're working on like internal servers um one the local environment survey that, that happened quite recently did cover um hosting environments as well and uh like customers own was was one was the highest one behind uh, in front of acquia and, and common ones so there's quite a lot of hosting still happening on bml servers internally and or just on your custom servers and things. Um, so yeah, if you're using one of those, so if you're more on the sort of enterprise level and you've got to deal with bare metal servers or you're just running a $5 a month VPS uh, on, on DigitalOcean or something, um, then yeah, this, this might be more relevant. So first of all, what is Ansible? Uh, Ansible is uh, an open source software and it's used for software provisioning and configuration management and application deployment. So in my experience, a lot of people think of it mostly as, as the provisioning side. So there's other similar things like Chef and Puppet I used previously as well. Um, so these are tools for setting up servers. So you know, you've got a server with nothing on and you want to install PHP and Apache and or MySQL. Um, these tools will do that for you. Um, but yeah, it's also used for application deployments, which I don't think is, is mentioned enough, actually. They can do everything. So it, it's a command line tool. So there are 
it offers several commands you can run in, inside a terminal. If you're running Mac or Linux that we've been talking about for a little while, um, you could open up a terminal and run commands there. Uh, it's written in Python, the core is written in Python, but you don't need to know Python to be able to use it. Uh, it's all configured in YAML, so if you're used to using Drupal uh, 8 or Symfony or Jekyll or you know, various other things, YAML is a pretty much a standard configuration language, I think, at this point. Um, so yeah, it's configured with YAML, which is nice, if, say, if you're used to using any of those other things. I think it should be familiar. And you can use it to run ad hoc commands on remote servers. So if you've got a server in, let's say, DigitalOcean or somewhere, uh, you could run just commands like Ansible something, uh, and it will just run them from your laptop or from a, some control node onto a number of remote servers. So you can use it for installing software packages. So we get like your PHP or your, or your uh, Nginx or your Apache, uh, as well as performing deployment steps. And there's a batteries included approach. So Ansible includes modules like Git and Composer that are quite applicable to PHP development projects, as well as your normal sort of, is this service running? Is this directory created, et cetera? So when I've used other sort of other similar-ish tools, they haven't had that sort of PHP Composer level stuff. Um, you've got to really integrate everything on the on the command line level, like running actual raw commands. So it, it's quite nice to have you know, a, a module like a Git module that we can use. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is there are actual integrations with those services we've already talked about. So um, my site that I've relaunched recently is on a DigitalOcean server, uh, and those playbooks are in the Git repository. But I use those playbooks to actually provision the whole server from scratch. So I didn't need to go into DigitalOcean and, and click add a new droplet. That was all done through Ansible. And there's other ones there for Linode and Amazon AWS and other things as well. So you can do you know, pretty much everything from the command line. So the key sort of parts then for, Ansible, for an Ansible setup are uh, first we need hosts uh, or inventories. And this is just a, a file. Uh, so it could be an any file, a YAML file, that tell Ansible where your servers are. So it needs to know, you know IP addresses or host names or ranges for it to connect to. Um, you can do dynamic ones as well. So if you've got a lot of servers on a, on a particular um, provider, you can have it give you that dynamically. But yeah, we won't talk about that too much, too much here. Uh, commands we've already talked about. So I'm on my laptop and I'm going to run Ansible um, ping something. It's going to run those commands against the servers. Uh, playbooks are collections of, of commands and tasks that are grouped into YAML files. Uh, tasks we've just talked about, and then roles are collections of playbooks. So if you've got a, a specific task or that you want to rerun, you know, if you want to install Apache, if you can take that, might, let's say take 10 steps, uh, 10 tasks, you can combine those into, into a role that we'll see later. Uh, and there's lots of these roles on systems like Ansible Galaxy. So it's sort of, uh, if you think of Drupal.org for, for modules and themes, uh, that's the equivalent for Ansible. And uh, a lot of people write these open source roles, including me, who I've written a few of them before previously. Uh, so why did I choose to use Ansible? Um, so I used to use something else that was quite similar. Um, but yeah, I switched to Ansible a few years ago. I was using it for doing my um, server configuration stuff, but not for the deployments for quite a while. And then eventually moved everything into Ansible. Um, and the main reasons for that are familiar syntax. So as I said, most of it's configured with YAML, which I use a lot in Drupal 8 and Symfony and other things as well. Uh, it's really easy to read. So if the playbooks are stored inside the, the project Git repository, uh, anybody can open up a YAML file and sort of read through it and figure out what it does. Um, I've seen you know, other like other files in different languages that aren't that easy to read. Um, yeah, I'll finish there. Um, there are no server dependencies. So as long as you can connect to a server through SSH connection and it has Python on it, um, you don't need to install anything else uh, compared to using something like Puppet where you need to install a whole sort of Puppet master setup on the server and have that link to your uh, your nodes. Yeah, you don't need to do that with this setup, which is quite nice. Yeah, 
as long as you can SSH into it, you can do stuff with it in Ansible. And yeah, it's really easy to add to an existing project in, in my experience. Um, I haven't had to change any of the you know, application code to get anything to run, really. Um, being able to just drop in Ansible onto an existing project or server, yeah, it's that's been really easy. I don't have to change anything. And as I said, it does include some relevant modules like Git and Composer and you know, other things like that. And then item potency uh, is basically meaning anything only gets run when it needs to. So when you run, uh, as we think of an example, so when you first run a deploy and you need to create a you know, your project directory and a releases directory and things, um, it will check if that's if you know that directory exists and if it does, it won't try and create it again. Um, and then you know, if you, if you try to install. Apache, it will only install it again if it's not been installed already. So um, it's something that, you know, again, in, in previous systems, I'd have to have done that check manually to say, does this directory exist? And, and if not, you know, try and create it. So, it, so it's quite nice that Ansible sort of does that for me by default. So yeah, hosts and inventories. trees. Uh, this is a, uh, an example of a host file using the uh, ini or the .ini syntax. Um, so in this case, we're defining a group called web servers, and we could be using the. Hey, uh, bless you. Thank you. Um, Sorry. <laughs> the uh, 192.168.33.10 IP address. This is a vagrant box virtual machine running locally, um, but we're going to put it into a group called web servers. Uh, and this, you know, if I had multiple of these, you could put them, you know, uh, multiple IP addresses in here, or you could define a range. So if you had, you know, from 33.10 to 33.20, you could just sort of do 10 20. Uh, I think it supports some sort of regular expression or grouping in here as well. Uh, or you could say, you know, if you had a www1 to 3, you know, you could do that as, as a group as well. Uh, and then we have the option to define variables. So in this case, we're just going to define the SSH port, which is just the default 22, port, port 22 there. So that's uh, the first way of doing it. The other way of doing it is using YAML. Uh, which I prefer because um, it's, I find it quite nice to have some consistency across the across the board. Um, and if you're using uh, variables inside playbooks, then you can copy and paste them into this file without having to change anything, which is quite nice if you are moving things around. So these two files do the same thing, basically. Um, yeah. So commands. Uh, so the first command we look at is just the Ansible command, which is the one that runs the just the ad hoc commands on against servers. So uh, we tell it which hosts to run on. So we can say run on all the hosts, and then we specify our host file, our, our inventory file, using dash i. So we can use host on host on YAML, and then specify the module. So we can use the ping module just to make sure that everything is you know everything can speak to everything else. Uh, and this is what we get back. So we can see it's run against our web servers group. Uh, Ansible will try and figure out some facts about the server that it's running on, uh, such as you know the, the operating system family and distribution and things. Uh, in this case, it's found Python, so it knows where Python is, which you know, it needs to, to do its thing. Uh, nothing has changed, so the change is false, and then we've sent a ping and we've got a pong back. So you know we know that we've been able to connect to the server through SSH and run an Ansible thing on it. Um, so if we wanted to do a, like a really basic sort of deployment here, we could use the command module. Uh, so again, we can specify the host file, uh, dash M this time is, is the command module. And we can just pipe through just a, a normal sort of shell command as arguments using dash A. So we could just say git pull, um, go into a directory called slash app and just do a git pull in that directory. Um, I use this quite a lot if I just want to look at all the servers that I've got running and just sort of see how much disk space they've got running or how much memory they've got. You just want to run sort of three minus M on 10, 20, 100 servers. Uh, you could just run a little ad hoc command like that. Um, and as I said, there are modules available for these, uh, for some of these things. So this is the same command again, but using the, uh, the Git module. So uh, the dash M now instead of command is using Git. So uh, git module and then our arguments become a, a key value 
based set of arguments. So the repository we're going to clone from is this GitHub repository, and it's called Transible, which is Drupal Ansible because naming things is hard. Um, so yeah, repository equal. So uh, repository also could be called uh, source actually as well. And our destination is slash app. So again, the destination we're going to want to clone this repository into or update from. Okay, tasks and playbooks. So this is the same thing again, basically, but in a in a playbook. Uh, so we use final hosts again. So our host is web servers, or it could be all, or it could be databases, or, or whatever you're hosting your inventory file setup like. Uh, we could define the Git repository as a variable under a vars key, and put that in there, and then use it. Uh, if you just well, sim, no, so under this repo key here, we can use the double curly brace mustache type syntax to use our variable. So yeah, if you're using Twig or you know, Ginger 2 or uh, any of these type of Vue.js, you know, you'd be used to the, the double curly brace syntax as well. Um, and then the tasks, we're just going to say give it a name, which is to update the code. We're going to use the git module again, uh, our repository URL we can call from above. There's our destination. Uh, we can specify the stuff as well, like the version and whether to update as well. So it's basically the same thing as we just saw with a couple of extra options in it. Uh, and this is how we run it. So we can use the Ansible playbook command, uh, specify the name of our playbook. So just playbook.yaml in this case, and again, pass through our inventory file, our inventory file. and that will run our playbook. Uh, roles, uh, so just collections of tasks and variables and handlers. Um, so we could use them as an example to just configure a, a LAMP stack, so a, a Linux server with Apache and MySQL and PHP on it. Uh, and whilst you could install these by hand, I like to use a requirements file, so requirements.yaml file. And we can specify our uh, roles we want to install. So this is you know, similar to our composer JSON file or our, our trash make file, I'm sure my Drupal page. Um, we can specify each source. We can specify uh, the version number as well, which I suggest doing. Um, and these are all some names based by the author and then the name of the, the role. So in this case, we're going to say, use uh, Jeff Gerling's Apache and Composer and MySQL and PHP and PHP MySQL roles. Mm -hmm. uh, we can install these using the Ansible Galaxy command. So I said Ansible Galaxy is sort of the Drupal.org or the packages of, of Ansible. Um, so by running this command, it will go to Ansible Galaxy. This will look at our requirements file and just install them in a, in a local directory. Yes, this is what our provisioning playbook could look like. So we're going to specify our host file at the top, at the top, and then use role the roles key and just list out our order of roles we want to install. Uh, here, the the order matters in, in this place. So in in the previous slide, like this, the, the order in our requirements file does not matter. It will just download them all and install them um, as needs. Here, here the order does matter. So uh, part of me always wants to put a uh, Apache then Composer because alphabetical ordering, um, but then the provision will always fail because it will try to install, it will do Apache first and then Composer, but hasn't installed PHP yet, and Composer needs PHP. So yeah, you have to put them in the right order for them to run. So we need PHP to be installed before we install Composer. Um, yeah, and that would basically give us our, our Apache MySQL and PHP stack just by including, by how is that like eight, nine, ten lines of YAML? Uh, each role usually, I think most cases, will have some variables that we can use to configure. So uh, if we're using Apache and we want to use some Apache virtual hosts, um, then we can specify a server name and the document route to our Apache virtual host. Uh, we can do something similar for the version of PHP and which other extra modules we're going to want to install. So again, we can use the double curly brace variable syntax there to use our PHP version in multiple places. And we can use it to configure uh, MySQL. So we can specify the name for our database and then our users for our database. So in this case, the database name is going to be main, and our user is going to be 
user and the password is going to be secret. And then we can set our privileges just to say that this user can do anything with any of the tables inside that database. And yeah, we can run the Ansible playbook command again, uh, run the provision.yaml playbook and specify the host file again, and that will run this playbook. So this is you know, what we'd see. Uh, so it starts by saying provision the, the web service. So that's the name we've put into, uh, into the top of the playbook. Uh, it will gather those facts that we talked about at the beginning. So we, which version of the operating system are we going to, to use because the variable names will, could be different. So like Apache is Apache 2 on Debian based ones and uh, HTPD on Red Hat and uh, CentOS based systems. Um, so we need to figure that out there. And you can see that this third task there is including some Amazon Linux variables, some OS specific variables. And yeah, it was plug on through and yeah, at the bottom there will update the app cache and start installing the things that we've told it to install. And then uh, other things happen in the middle. And then at the bottom of the file, we can see it's just doing uh, some cleanup steps and then restarting some services. So it's installed Apache and MySQL, and then it's going to just run them at the bottom there. Uh, and then we can see right in the very bottom uh, a recap so we can see which groups of services has been um, updated and how many things have changed and how many things have failed and been skipped, etc. So we get a little, little summary at the bottom there. And then if we were to run that, we'd end up with this. So um, just a Apache 2 server running, um, yeah, running on server with our uh, server name that we specified. However, um, if you try to go to a site at this point, we get an error message like this. So we, uh, we don't have permission to access this resource error because we have no website yet. Nothing, nothing to save right now. <clears throat> so before we get to the deployment part, um, we we'll mentioned Ansible Vault and how we can use it to keep things secure. So there are a couple of problems in, inside this playbook. So if we just look at the, the bottom section, so MySQL users, um, our username and our password are, are stored in plain text. So you know, anybody reading this file could you know, read the file and see what our database password was, which is not a good idea. And especially if you can also push this onto GitHub or, or some sort of or public GitLab repository or something, you know, everybody could see your stuff, which is bad. So to get around that, there's a tool called Ansible Vault. So this is included with Ansible um, itself. Uh, we can create a new vault using Ansible Vault Create and then give it a name, so vault.yaml. And it's going to open up uh, your default editor, so maybe it's Vim or you know, whatever your default thing is. And you can put in your variables here. So you know, I tend to put everything in the vault with vault underscore, just to make it you know, really easy to see you know, this comes from a vault. Um, yeah, and anything that's secret and I don't want to be visible, we'll just go into this file and yeah, we can save this file. Uh, if we'd like just to open the file, uh, this is what we'd, it's what we'd see. So everything gets encrypted and hashed and everything. We can push this to you know, GitHub or wherever, well, it's not a problem. Uh, I typically have sort of a, a, an intermediary file. So I, I know where I say a prefix vault variables with vault underscore at the beginning, I, I usually have another file where I, I take that off there just to make things maybe just a little bit cleaner. Um, but yeah, I'm not quite sure why this is a convention I've got into, but I tend to think it's because of a cleanliness thing. Uh, with those two, two things now in place, uh, we can substitute the database name and the password and the username with the variables that we've used. So um, we don't have that problem anymore of things being visible in plain text, which is nice. Uh, if you want to edit the, the vault, we could use Ansible Vault Edit and then give it the name. Uh, we can also use Ansible Vault B if we just want to view the files again. Uh, it's one slight change to our playbook command. Uh, is we need to specify a password. So when we created the vault, it would ask you to, to type in a password, which I'd usually store in LastPass or 1Password or something. Um, 
yeah, I mean, they're going to need to decrypt that vault again when you want to run the playbook so Ansible can get the values out of it. Uh, so you can do that interactively on the command line by saying ask vault pass, and passing that through as an option. Uh, it will then prompt you to re enter the password again. And assuming you've done it correctly, it will you know, decrypt the vault and do your provisioning for you. Uh, if you're doing this in sort of a CI environment, you know, I, I like quite using. Um, GitHub, GitHub Actions or GitLab CI or Jenkins or something, or Circle, various ones. Um, then obviously you're not going to have the option to type in that password during the deploy, if you always make the deploy. Uh, so you can pass through a, an option, so vault password file, and give it a, a, password, a path to a file that contains the password. Um, so typically what I do in this case is most of these have an option for storing environment variables. So I'll store the, the vault password in an environment variable uh, have that output to a file temporarily so that Ansible could use and then delete it once it's finished. So that's how I've got around that problem. I wouldn't call it secret.txt though, that's a little bit obvious. Okay, uh, so how do you then use Ansible to do some sort of basic deployment? Um, so we could have a deploy.yaml playbook and we could specify some tasks like creating our project directory. So our project directory is going to be in slash app in this case. Uh, we can use file module just to say you know, this is uh, the path is slash app and should be a directory and it will then go and create that directory automatically or at least check that it, it exists or not. And if it doesn't exist, it will try and create it for you because open potency. Uh, we can use our sync maybe to upload our files. So playbook do is a magic variable that Ansible has to know where the playbook is that's being run. Uh, so in this case, you know, this is pro I tend to put them Ansible inside like an Ansible directory or a, a tools slash Ansible directory. So we need to go up one or one in this case, but one or two levels uh, to actually find the code that we're meant to be deploying. Uh, and then if it's a Drupal 8 project or maybe Symfony project or something, we're going to want to install our composer dependencies. So we can use the composer module and then just give it a command to, to run. So install and inside the slash app working directory. Uh, and there are other um, default variables that we're not specifying here. So like no dev for composer is, is the default option. We don't need to include that. I think optimize autoloader is the default option as well. So I'm only showing you know, a small number of the options that are, are available. Uh, so we have some disadvantages to, to this deployment that we've seen. Um, there's a single point of failure. So first of all, if you just go back, uh, you can see everything is going to one slash app directory. Uh, and if then a build was to fail, uh, for some reason that site would be down. Uh, if it is down, there's no option to roll back again. Uh, our data is sort of in plain text that we've already seen, which we've actually sorted using, using the vault. Uh, so there's a tool that I like using for, for deployments. Uh, and this tool is called Ancestrano. Uh, so this is just an, another role that's available on Galaxy. So very similar to you know, the Jeff Kelly roles that you saw earlier on. Um, we can just download these off Galaxy and put them into our deployment. Uh, and this is a, a port of another tool called Capistrano, which is a Ruby-based um, tool, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think two people have ported into to Ansible. So it has you know, some, some nice features. Uh, one is multiple release directories. So we don't have you know, that single point of failure there anymore. Uh, we can create a different directory for every release and then only make it the active version of the site once everything passes, assuming that it does. Uh, we have the option for shared files and paths. So um, like our settings or PHP file is obviously something that we're gonna wanna keep across multiple deployments or, or our site's default files directory. Uh, if people are uploading files, we want those to be there um, after we do a deploy. Um, so we can do that. Uh, it's customizable, so it gives us various hooks that we can build into um, and, and change if we want to. Uh, there's multiple strategies for doing a deployment. So there's rsync, like we just sort of saw, it'll just copy everything. Uh, we can use Git or, or Subversion or something else. We can change it as we need to. Uh, it takes us in multi stage environments. So, if you're doing dev stage prod, which I assume most of us probably are at this point, um, it supports that as well. 
Um, the problem with doing multiple release directories is that they can get quite big if you deploy often. So there is an option there to prune the old ones. So you can say only keep the last three or five or 10, whatever suits you. Uh, and there's the option there to do rollbacks if you do need to. So there's two roles, one for deploying and one for rolling back. Uh, so to pull them into the project, we can add them to our requirements YAML file, uh, ancestrano.deploy, ancestrano.rollback. And we can put them into the deploy playbook uh, under the roles key, uh, like we saw earlier on. So it's trying to deploy as a role. Uh, as I said, there's various ways to configure this. So uh, we can say answers trying to deploy to is, is the directory that's going to you know, check everything out into. Uh, I tend to store that into a variable. Uh, I tend to like having these sort of project level variables and release level variables. We'll see some of those in a minute. Uh, this one's going to deploy from Git and it's going to deploy from our master branch. Um, and it's going to go to that Git repository that we saw earlier on. Uh, yeah, and to run it, we're just going to use the same Ansible playbook command that we saw previously and run our deployment YAML file. Uh, we can see our Antistrano.deploy tasks happening. So right at the beginning there, it's going to, uh, after including the initial tasks there, it's going to look for the base path the check that already exists. So our, our slash app directory already exists. And then it's going to create the release directory or at least ensure that exists. <clears throat> same, and then same for the share directory and everything else there as well. And then right at the end, uh, it's going to run uh, file permissions, then do the cleanup. Like I said, we can prune um, the last number of releases. Uh, so we'll do that there on the fourth task. Uh, and then, yeah, very last thing is good to send some anonymous stats to the answer trial site if, unless you opt out of it. That just shows you the number on the website there, show the number of deployments in a week. That's just going to send that information off to them. Um, but you can switch it off if you need to. And we get the same play recap at the bottom, you know, the number of things that got changed and failed and skipped, et cetera. It's so actually on the server, this is what, this is how things look like now. So we, if we go into the app directory, we see three things. So our site isn't directly inside the app directory anymore. Uh, it's, it's somewhere else. So this is the standard um, format that Capistrano and by proxy Ancestrano use. Uh, so it has a releases directory. Again, you can, you can customize these if you need to. Um, I never have, but um, you can. Um, and you'll notice that the, the first option there, the current thing isn't a, a directory. Uh, that's actually a link. Uh, so it's a symbolic link to one of the release directories. So the active release is this date stamped directory inside releases that's uh, 19th of July 2019, I guess, before I did this for TripleCon, maybe. Can't remember. Um, and yeah, and with, inside the release directory, we have a number of date stamped directories. Um, yes, yeah, so it's automatically generated at the time of doing the deploy and built based on the date and the time of doing the deploy. Uh, if we do need to roll back, we have the option of, of having a rollback.yaml playbook uh, that looks you know, very similar, if not identical to the deploy one. Uh, the only difference being we're going to use the rollback role rather than the, the deploy role. And um, all we need to do is tell it where to deploy to or where to roll back to. And it will automatically go back to the next, next one for you, which is pretty cool. Keep going on the time, hurrying the time here. Yeah, okay. So as I said, um, you can customize Ancestrano. Uh, it offers a number of hooks that we can we can hook into and change stuff. Uh, so there are five that it gives us. So first is the setup, uh, then updating the code. So pulling it down from Git or, or whatever. Uh, shared symlink. So maybe our settings.php file is is um, in this shared directory and we want to run something then. Then the symlink happens to make it actually um, live. So the current symlink is updated and then our cleanup. And we can hook into before or after of any of those things. So there's uh, 10 different things that we could hook into if you wanted to. So yeah, maybe shared is yeah, our files directory or our logs directory. Um, and yeah, cleanup is maybe we want to do something like you know removing node modules if you are building a Tailwind CSS during a deploy, 
and you want to clean up the node modules afterwards, you can do that as part of the cleanup step, possibly. Or you could have like a database export that gets um, exported prior to doing the build, you could clean up there, for example. And being roles, uh, they do offer, uh, they do expose some variables that we can hook into. So uh, the, those build steps that we just saw, uh, there's a before and after version, as I said, uh, but there's also a variable there that we can use and we can point at Sistrano at a playbook that we want to inc that include our own specific tasks. Um, so normally I'll have a, a deploy directory here, so you, and inside that I'll have a number of you know, my YAML files and these, the names match usually. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll share tasks file. Uh, I have a playbook for that, and then one for after it runs, yeah, just for example. Um, as I said, I do have release level variables as well. So if the directory name changes dynamically on every release, how do we know where it is? Um, and Ancestrano gives us that, gives us that in uh, this Ancestrano release path variable. And we can use that to know just to run things in that in this the context of this specific release, so we know where our our code is, we know where our web directory is going to be, and you know if if Drush is is added as a dependency through Composer, then we can know where the version of Drush is for that release. And yeah, so here's, uh, after updating the code, yeah, so after, after we've updated our code and pulled everything we can get, we're going to want to install everything through Composer. Uh, this happens in the after update code.yaml playbook. I'm going to just run our composer install command inside that working directory, inside the actual release directory. Uh, after we've added our symlink, we're going to maybe run our database updates. Uh, so again, if our settings.php is inside that shared symlink, we can, we'll need that to be in place before we can run database updates. Um, so we can do that there. And then after our symlink, the main sim link has changed and the site is live at that point. We're going to want to run Drupal clear cache so just to rebuild the cache. As you can see how we're using the, the release drush path and the release web path here to do that. And after that's what happened, we should have a, a website that we can look at. It's been built and deployed to Ancestral. So we've, we've Touched a little bit on this already. Managing data across deployments. So um, yeah, there is this option to have Ancestrano shared paths and, and files. So again, our, our sites directory, uh, we're going to want to have that persisted across multiple releases. So we can just put that into Ancestrano shared paths, and it will simulate it for us. Uh, so this is again on the server inside the app directory, uh, inside the shared directory. This time uh, we have. Like a mirror of, of the file structure, of the directory structure. So inside websites to file files, we have uh, this stuff. So this is just our compiled, aggregated CSS and our PHP. So pretty normal sites to file files, pretty normal for a new site anyway. Um, but if we go into app current, so that's the actual live version of the site into websites to file files, uh, we'll see that files is actually you know not a directory again it is the same link back up however many levels it needs to to um, link it in that way so every deploy it's going to relink that file so the files are still there because people will get annoyed if the images go away or something um i used to do settings files in, in the same way so i used to have um, a settings or php file usually inside that shared directory um, i need to put there um, manually create it. Actually, it's the first thing. But recently, recently, what we started doing is generating them as part of the actual deployment itself. Uh, so inside, the, how I'm doing that is inside the vault. Uh, I'm specifying the database name and the username and the password and Drupal eight. At least we've got a hash salt value that we're going to want to use to make sure that you log in and everything is correct. Uh, so they'll go inside the vault, and then I'll have a this the intermediary vars file again to just to clean up those variable names. So we get our, our database name is equal to fault database name. And within the variables, the main variables directory, I have this Drupal settings key. So this is a role that I wrote. Uh, it's a Drupal settings file role. 
Um, so this is going to automatically generate that settings file for me as part of the deploy. Uh, so it does support multi-site. So I need to give it the Drupal root first of all. So it's just in the app web because our Drupal site is inside web. Uh, and this, uh, it needs then this list of, of sites. So say it could support multiple. Uh, so in this case, the, the name matches the name of the site or at least the, um, the directory name of the site. And then specify the settings. So with databases, we could multiple databases. So they're keyed by default default. Uh, and then we can use the database name and the username and the password again there from, from the vault and the hash from the vault. And as for our configuration directories, again, for Drupal 8, um, you know, put our configuration in YAML. At least I recommend you put it into YAML. So this is how it looks in our playbook. Uh, this is just a, this is what the, the actual role is doing behind the scenes. So there's a, a template, which we haven't, we haven't talked about templates yet. But they're very similar to Twig. Um, they're written using Ginger 2, which is sort of the Python equivalent of Twig. I think they, one was based on the other, or they both came from the same repository at, at some point. So they're very, very, very similar. You can just see we're doing some looping over those over these values and passing through some defaults in, in certain places. So this is what the module is going, or what the role is going to be using to uh, generate the file. And um, yeah, this is again inside the actual tasks of that role. Uh, we're going to make sure that the site directory exists. So inside the Drupal root, sites directory, and then our site name, that needs to be a, a directory. So that needs to exist first in order to put the settings file in it. Uh, so we do that with the, the file module with some looping. Uh, we use template module to create the actual settings file. So we tell it the template name to use. So it's settings.php.j2 for Ginger2 and pass through the name of the file to actually generate. So again, looping over that item. So with sub elements is going to, anything with sub elements or with, or with sub elements or with sub items, with items, um, it'll just basically do a loop, like a for each loop over, over them and pass through each value into that item variable that we can see uh, above. So it's going to take each of those and loop over them and generate those files automatically. So the advantage of this is you know, sometimes I want to change something in the settings file as part of that deployment, uh, which I couldn't really do that if it's just one shared version on a server without going and accessing the server directly. Um, so yeah, maybe I want to change, um, I don't know, think of example, if I maybe want to turn on and disable the caching or something um, in a settings file, I can just do that inside the, the Ansible variables do the deploy and it will be there in the next generated version of the file uh, rather than having to you know, log into the server and change it manually. Uh, yeah, and that rolls on Ansible Galaxy for people to use if they want to. Um, as I said, it does offer multiple environments. So you can have um, dev test prod. So the way I've been doing this recently is uh, having obviously multiple databases. So one for production and one for staging uh, and then multiple users as well. So one user for each database. Again, we store these you know, in the vault. So our live password, and our live name, and our staging name um, all go into the vault. I'm using them there, same as we saw previously. And then in our host file, we have separate groups. So you see now we've got a production group, which is before this just would have been all. Uh, so we've got a production group and with children, and in there, we can define our variables. So uh, this is on the same SSH host, so the same vagrant virtual box here before. Uh, our deploy path is still in slash app, uh, same as before. Um, we'll be still be deploying the master branch by default, at least, um, same as before. And we've got all our Drupal settings. And if you want to maybe install Drupal by default, if this is a, a pre-prod environment, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that in live, obviously. Um, maybe on a, on a feature branch site, you want to install it automatically. And then also we have a staging set. So the only thing that's changed here is, is the project deploy path. It's now app slash test um, to a different directory. So, um, and we could deploy a different branch. In this case, we deploy the developer branch. If you're doing something, so sort of Git flow-ish, um, I can go there. Um, you can add an, an all directory. I think this actually might be implied. It might just do this for you by default. 
uh, and then yeah, we can still run the same deploy command again, but we can limit it to run on certain hosts to certain groups. Um, so I need, the other way of doing this is have multiple inventory files and, and call the different inventory file, um, have like a production.yaml inventory and a stage in YAML. But yeah, I've recently, recently started doing it this way. I sort of prefer this just passing through a limit option. Um, and yeah, if you're doing this in your sort of CI environment, you can have it do this automatically for you, obviously. So this will run on, on staging, and then this one will run on production or live. And um, that would do this, yeah. It would just run the same thing and pull through the right variables based on you know, these variables, based on whichever group you're calling. That's the end of time. Um, let's go do a quick demo, if you, if you have time for a demo. I really have time. It's 10 to 8, do we have time for a demo? I think so. I don't think we usually have an issue with uh, things running on too much. Okay. So that aforementioned Drupal site that we had running is, this is it. So this is a, a Drupal 8 site that's running inside a VirtualBox server that's running on Vagrant, as this message implies. <laughs> Um, and this was provisioned using the same, do this in, do this in Sublime Tech. So this is on GitHub actually, people can check it out afterwards if they want to. Uh, so let's see, we've got our, our requirements file, so we have specified some versions uh, in here, and then we've got our Ancestrano deployment and our Jeff Gerling ones. And then our, uh, my one, the settings file role. Uh, provision is just going to do the provisioning pretty much what we just, you know, what we saw on the slides. Uh, deploy YAML is using the deploy role and it's gonna pull in various variable files which are all stored inside this variables directory. So again, I typically have a, a, product, a provision vault and a variables file and a deploy vault so to keep things uh, tidy. This is gonna deploy using rsync. In this case, it's going to deploy from two levels up. So this is inside tools Ansible. Here, so we're going to go from our directory up to levels, uh, go into our deploy path, uh, which is inside one of these variable files. We're going to keep five releases. These are our hooks we've defined, and we're going to share our settings, our files directory across each one. Uh, we have a vault password, which is just transport. So, yeah, that's fine. Uh, let's see. So the document root is a variable made up of three other variables. So we've got our deploy path, our current directory, which is uh, and sort of current uh, root. We can configure PHP and everything else. Uh, we have a vault, which is encrypted. We have a deploy vault, which is encrypted. And then some deploy directories. So there's our release specific variables. Uh, we're going to install Drupal again on this, on this one, and there's our settings file again. So this is all managed um, through this. So I can, yeah, I can log into this and do, you know, it's a fully working Drupal 8 site. So uh, if you did want to change something, uh, maybe we did want to, let's see here, yeah, maybe we want to change, maybe we don't want to store Drupal on, on every, every deploy, because this is, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that in production. And maybe, Let's see, we've got, how many directories do we have? So I've got, um, the top half is the local and then the bottom one is uh, the, um, the Vagrant box. So if we go in here, we can see the same in the directory, that'd be helpful. Uh, we've got our three, or two directories and our one symlink. So uh, current one is from earlier today. Yeah, I might test this out to make sure it still works for the last one of and then we have four releases at this point. Uh, so yeah, maybe if you wanted to change this, I think it's, um, let's just try and keep limit. Is that the right thing? Let's see. There's a variable we can pass through to tell it how many to keep. It's probably inside the slides. I should just probably look at the slides. What is it? Limit. I thought it was limit. Keep. Keep releases. There we go. So if we wanted to say only keep, you know, 
two releases. We can do that. Uh, so I'm switching to Linux. I'm using my Mac keyboard now because my muscle memory is all confused. And um, yeah, so if you wanted to do full playbook, so we're inside the root level here. So move this down. Yeah, so I can just run and civil full playbook tools and so we'll deploy YAML. There we go. So this is going to run a deployment. Uh, it's just going to make sure the release directory is something there to begin with. Um, then it's going to do our composer dependencies at this point. So I'm going to reinstall those on every deploy just in case you know, there's an update there. And sometimes, so this can take a while, but sometimes if you've still got a the directory from a previous release, it still sort of uses the previous one. So I tend to not share those across every deploy and just have them created by default. Uh, let's see what else we're doing here. If I just scroll back up a little bit, um, it's going to put our soft links in for our files directory. Again, um, it's going to, uh, it's not going to the Drupal install this time because we told it not to. And if we just go back here, we'll see. Uh, Drupal install is so uh, yeah. So install Drupal only happens when Drupal install. So that's essentially saying equals equals true. So yeah, only install Drupal when that variable is set. So that's fine. We build our cache. So we've got the latest, the latest everything. Changes the soft link for new release. So that one makes it live, and then does some tidy. So again, if any point these fail it doesn't do the release. So if something breaks, then the live site isn't broken, which is not. Uh, so that site is still up. And then if we go back down here, we should only see yeah, our two release directories that we configured. So it's pruned out some of the old ones that we didn't want anymore. Uh, it didn't install Drupal, so that's good. We'll keep that from before. Uh, the other thing we could do quickly is Look at the settings file a little bit more, maybe. Yeah, so we're setting in the trusted hopes and things here. There's an option to put in like extra parameters if you do need to you know, pass through anything else. Uh, if you're overriding a config sync or something, uh, you can just, anything that's not included from here, we can just override at the bottom half here. Um, so maybe if we did uh, anything that's in this text file, we can override default settings. <coughs> Do I not have a default setting? Uh, let's see, Drupal site name settings. So we can just see that. No, that's not what I want. Settings. Just trying to think of something we could do. Close my window, just kids are excited, clapping and banging and pots and pans in it. Do code. Oh, there's a setting that we can change inside settings or PHP that changes the site name. Settings. Because then we can just see quickly that the settings file is regenerated every time. Site. Site dot name. No. We find lots of things dot name. That's the one. Config system site dot name. This in here, and we can put yeah, approval. Sure. Yeah, so then this will get added to the bottom of the generated settings file that it makes. So if we just do another deploy, it's going to run through that process again, rebuild our settings file in this case, and deploy everything again. And yeah, this has been quite a night, like I've been using this to approach on. Um, yeah, my Drupal site that I've recently built and my freelance project, and there'll be something similar for some other, you know, work projects as well, which seem to have worked quite well. Yeah. Let's wait for this to finish. Uh, and as I said, this is on um, Transible. 
yeah, this is all on GitHub as well, so people can take a look at this and there's a little custom module that does the site message. And yeah, if we just go and review this, hopefully the site name should change now. So yeah, site name has changed to Drupal Yorkshire. So it's regenerated that file for us um, on the fly as part of the deployment. And yeah, I had a thought this morning, but taking like what I've done in this part of this talk and some other blog posts and things, I've put them into a book. Um, so I'm going to start doing that at some point soon. But you can go here and sign up for a mailing list if people want to do that. It'd be quite cool. Um, and yeah, here we got it. If you have some time for questions, um, this is a link to the talk on my website as well. If you want to check out the slides later on. I was going to ask a question, but my neighbors are going to go berserk. And yeah, yeah, my kids are doing it as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask you in about two or three minutes then. I'll yeah, be back. Mike. I, I might want to give it a minute while everyone does it. It's a bad time for asking questions. <laughs> yeah, give it a couple of minutes. Just keep talking, David. Cool. Yeah. Is there anything else I can show in this while we're doing it? Uh, you did mention, Oliver, about not uh, installing Drupal every time. Yeah. Uh, why, why is that? Why was it? Um, is it because oh, you're installing Drupal itself and not necessarily the files? Yeah, exactly. This is doing like an actual site install, like this, ah. this section here. Yeah, so probably don't want to do that in production, but that's something you probably do want to do on like a feature branch build site. So actually that could be one, like we've got this sort of setup here, right? We've got, let me if you do have a production setup and that's just, whoa, what the hell is this? Oh, it's the thing. Okay, fine. Read back stuff. Yeah, so maybe we did have like the staging one here. Uh, the hosts could be the same because we're on the same server. Um, again, this is why I quite like the YAML format because I can literally just copy and paste these from one to the other. Uh, so if we said, yeah, Drupal install, let's just take that from here. Uh, so maybe on. Yeah, on production we want to say false. But on here we want to say true. Uh, yeah, so rebuild the staging site every time with a fresh install, but don't do it on production. Like we could do it here by using staging and production. Um, and yeah, maybe we also want to do like a, what was our thing? Triple, least triple path. Oh, I'll still have a hand for the project. Project apply path. Yeah, so maybe here we want to have, you know, rather than such app, we'd have such app test or something. Special indentation is right. Yeah, so if we want to do that, like that would make more sense to me, right? So we could say, you know, on production, don't reinstall everything because it's production. But on staging, then we want to, you know, we can do an install. So if we wanted to do this, we could just do the same. Oh, what am I doing? Yeah, we just do this and just say limit or just L staging. All right, that's what's just going to run just on the staging side. So in this case now, we should have slash. Something I'm just finished. Yeah, that's why I do that. So then you can have yeah separate variables for different different things. Yeah, nice. Don't don't install the don't reinstall the live site. <laughs> Every time it's probably a bad idea. Your neighbours quiet now, Richard. They are, yes. I told them <laughs> shut up. Stop, yeah. stop making all that clamoring noise, you people. No, I didn't say that. Here we go. <laughs> um, the, I wanted to ask you, Oliver, and maybe generally anybody else who knows, I've, in some circumstances I've seen where when it comes to production deployments, rather than, well, I think uh, Acquia do this and 
possibly others, where when you have a when you go to uh, deploy to production rather than running composer or rather than doing a git pull the latest tag whatever and then you do a, a composer install or update or whatever uh, and you're pulling the stuff by the web etc they they'll consider everything like an artifact and if it worked like this on stage there's at somewhere along the line they'll have zipped up all the files and then you just basically grab the static version of everything that's been deployed. <clears throat> that I presume that's not an uncommon thing. And uh, what I'm wondering is how are uh, are there any examples of of people using Ansible and you know, An An Ancestrano or something doing to, to do that kind of deployment to production. I mean, you could. I've not done it with this approach. Because then you could. I've used it for pushing like a pad, like a GitHub repo and like an Acquia repo, for example. And I've used Ansible to do like, you know, if you push to master on GitHub and it'll then do a composer install uninstall your CSS, so do what you're telling, compiling, etc. And then commit that to our, um, yeah, the secondary repo, similar to what BLT is doing. And yeah, that the repo gets deployed. So it's not right. doing it through like a zip file. But you could do a zip file with this with this approach as well, if you mm. feel like I did the right way of doing it. Um, but yeah, I haven't, because then what's still gonna happen is that if this task fails, so if, you, if your composer install fails, it just won't, it'll stop doing the build. Hmm. So um, that's so it's less of an issue given that if you were to do it with the basic approach and you know, composer install fails, the site is down. Whereas yeah. doing it with this approach, if composer install was to fail, then um, it yeah it just wouldn't. Yes, it didn't. Get as far, it won't get as fast production anyway. Yeah, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't uh, swap the sim link out. And... So, is this building containers then? When you say if this will fail, then it's just going to stop. No, um, the thing is checking the extra code on each thing and then just checking that it's doing, going to do it. Um, yeah, what it does is it does an installation of everything in a, in a new directory without touching the existing live site. And, cool? then, yeah. and then once everything's tested and working properly, uh, the, sim, the, the vhost file in essence gets updated to say the doc root is there the current release well, the is, yeah the vhost is always pointing at current so like in the provision yes, one yep. yeah so so document so it's always pointing at um excuse me if i remember where this is saved uh, vhost yes yeah, so the document is always pointing at um, current slash web, current web. Yep. But yeah, that current this this part is the key part, right? This only gets swapped out if the build is working. So yeah, mm. like try to think of an example <laughs> of something um, that could make it fail. But yeah, if it was to fail, then this current sim link just wouldn't get updated. Um, so yeah, in the in the, the situation the composer was to fail, then yeah, it just wouldn't get as far as live anyway. That sim link wouldn't get swapped. I mean, it, it would depend at which point at which um step we're running right so, so where where is that swap out command defined in your your ansibles it's it's not in mine it's part of the it's one of these hooks we can use here but this it's this simple hook like yeah so as long as i'm doing everything uh, as long as everything before this is passing it will hit this this one here it it's a feature of the and is it a fe is it a feature of the ns Ancestrano uh, role, is that what you say? You... Yeah, yeah, so we're going to find it quickly because it's all uh, so symlink.yaml. Get the current folder, yeah, there we go, right there. Yeah, so change the into a new release. So, yeah, it's going to use file module, and then rather than setting the directory, it'll just say it's the link, and it's going from, uh, yeah, here to here. So yeah, it's part of them, part of them, uh, the feature of the row. 
I don't know if that helps whoever asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah, it's, cool. it's not something I've had to write. It's just I can write the custom bits that I need, you know, based on whether it's Drupal 8 or Drupal 7 or Sculpin or whatever. Mm. And, you know, I just let like, it do its thing for the most part. Does that, does that help? Yeah, I was just curious because I have had some Ansible scripts that they've gone eh, and it's just fallen over before. So now I know that I can I can link all that stuff in. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely be rewatching this video. So it was a good idea to record it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also the video. I think I did I did it for CMS Philly as well recently. It's, it's all it's on the website as well. We'll check it out in the meantime. I used to work on a a site that used Capistrano. And um, I hated Capistrano. Was, uh, I came along far too late in the in the project to understand everything that people had done with it. So, but it it did the deployments properly, so that was fine. And I like I like the way it swapped out the um, how it dealt with the releases and yeah, provided yeah. rollback options and things. Yeah, th this is all very. Uh... Yeah, this set up here is very Capistrano-ish. Mm. You know, that's how it sets everything up with multiple releases and current directory. The minute yeah. I saw that, all of a sudden I realized, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> There's something quite nice you know, to me is that everything's written consistently in one thing rather than trying to do like the server provisioning with Ansible or Puppet and then doing deployments with Fabric or Capistrano or something. It's quite nice just to be able to sort of say, you know, everything's done in Ansible. That's quite nice. It's one, and it's one less thing to learn. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's been, exactly that's what I was been, thinking. Consistency is, a, is, a, is a quite a nice thing. But yeah, like even in this one, see, I'm using it to set up the solution even with, you know, set up, create the actual droplet that the site's going to be hosted on, that type of thing. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, the Ansible role is on GitHub and Gallic as well, if people want to check that out. So I thought it was pretty cool. So intended to support, yeah, D7 and D8 and 9, I guess, as well. Cool. Any more questions from anybody? Uh, Paul, you're asking where you're from, Ralph, or is that? Yeah, yeah just uh, we got a newcomer in the in the room there, oh, Ralph. Okay. Uh, just wondered where you were from. But what is he, Ralph? Uh, I, uh, I already joined at the beginning, so and I haven't arrived yet uh, right now. Uh, I'm from Germany, and I've heard about today's meetup from uh, Oliver on the Jeff Killing um, screencast last Tuesday, I guess it was. Cool. Where, where else are you in Germany? Uh, in southern Germany, in Nuremberg. Cool. Excellent. Well, good to see you. Come again. L likewise. <laughs> yeah. At the moment, it's easier than yeah, driving yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, I think this is going to become a normal thing, isn't it? Even when we get back to meeting mm -hmm. uh, in person, I think it um, be a good thing to you know, do the online as well, really. Yeah, or a hybrid thing, maybe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we talked about it for Pitch Free South Wales quite a lot recently, about how we're going to do it going forward. Like we were already trying to stream them and put them on YouTube or something afterwards. So we'd already started doing that. Of course, everything, everything about online afterwards. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out a way of doing it. I think it's a good idea that it runs the reach and brings new people in, and that can't be a bad thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, anything else? Any more questions? Anything people want to? Well, just to, um, Oliver, thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting. Um, just to bring it back to my first question, you're on a Mac, what local development environment do you use for Drupal? Mixture of things at the moment. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I started doing, uh, I was, <laughs> so I've started using symphonies over actually, just I've done to use DDEV and things and, and use Doxel pre, prior to that. But yeah, I've been using the symphony, symphony local server recently. I got a question for you then. How come you moved to DDEV from Doxel? Out of curiosity. How come? Um, I used Docs a lot in my last job, and I was curious to sort of try out some of the other ones. Um, but yeah, they just always, they all seem to be, all the Mac, all the Docker wrapper ones on Mac OS seem to be so slow because of all the copying of files from the native file system into the virtualization layer and in, into the containers. So it was like, especially trying to do testing on, t on TDD, it was taking like two minutes to run a test, which for me was uh, not, not that great. So. Yeah, so I mean, I was playing with this recently and sort of documented how I was using Symfony Server uh, to do Drupal with, and that's been quite useful. So I've been doing that recently. And that, that's quite nice because that works on Linux and Mac as well, which is quite nice. So it keeps everything, keeps everything on disk for files and things, and then she uses Docker for databases and other services and things. Yeah, hopefully it'll, Mac OS will start working with Docker nicely at some point. Well, there's yeah. been issues, issues there for ages, and Docker is saying that it's a Mac problem, and Mac is saying it's a Docker problem. Yeah. At least they'll be able to sort of figure out, I think, most on Windows. But. The solution is Linux. Yeah, I said my, my other laptop over here is my Lenovo laptop, which is running Pop OS or Ubuntu, so that's been, that's been using recently as well. I've pasted two issues uh, from the Docker roadmap in regards of the CPU performance on Mac as well as for the file system. They started working on it about a week ago, um, oh, wow. actively. Finally. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. I'm quite Definitely. lonely, but uh, <laughs> I thought they might be years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah so was... I'm pretty sure some of them are. Yeah, I, I, that's just what I was going to say. They've been saying, oh, yeah, we're working on it right now. Next release is going to be great. And that was two years ago. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording just so you're aware.